Acts chapter 10, verses 9 to 23a. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. When Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had had seen had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. You know, we, we read down to 9 uh, to um, 23a, and you know we've said this before. Remember, verses and chapters were added at a much later time. Um, and, and so sometimes a pastor will go, hey, 23a, and that just simply means the first sentence of 23. And so I think tomorrow we start in 23b, um, but or Monday. So uh, just a reminder of what the a, b, it's, they're not in your Bible, right? They're kind of uh, um, made up, you know, if you will, at that point when somebody's only reading like half of a passage. So um, we move now in, in this, this account to a second vision. Remember, we've already had one. Cornelius had a vision, and now we have a second one with Peter. And, and again, there's a thing to notice. It happened during prayer. It happened while the individual was praying. Now, you know, can I, can I just say here, we often do not hear from God. Why don't we hear from God? We don't hear from God because we don't put ourselves in a position of, of prayer, in a place to hear from Him. We're too distracted. Everything is just coming in at us. We're so distracted, we don't hear from Him. We don't hear because we're not praying, we're not studying, we're not meditating on His Word. We don't put ourselves in a position to hear from God, so we don't hear from God. When God is working when he's working, he's working on not just the sharer of the message, but also he's working on the hearer of the message. We must remember that. When God is challenging you to speak his word, to, to share your testimony with someone, well, he's working not just in you, but he's working in the lives of someone else who needs to hear that testimony. Not because we arrogantly think we need to speak. We've had that. Where people, you know, want to say something in the church because they go, well, God gave me a message. And it doesn't hit anybody. It was more because they, for their own ego, wanted to share. Oh, but we've had times where people say, I, I need to share a message. And they do. And it breaks out in testimony after testimony after testimony. Because it was God. God is working in the messenger, the sharer of the message, and the hearer. We see that in Peter and Cornelius. We see that in Philip in this treasure of the queen, right? We saw it in Saul and Ananias. We saw it all the way back in Jacob and Esau. Jacob was scared to go to his brother, and Esau was already being prepared by God. God is always working. He just calls us to be faithful, <laughs> to trust and obey, because there's no other way, right? He calls us to be faithful. Peter fell into a trance. During it, God gives an object lesson to Peter. 
He had seen uh, uh, Gentiles saved, and yet uh, I wonder if it didn't change him. We see later on a, 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 a spout between him and Paul because Peter was around Gentile believers, but as soon as the other Jewish believers came, he kind of would segregate out. Good morning, Robert, right? And he would segregate himself out. And so we see here this object lesson coming to Peter. He had seen Gentiles saved, and yet it might not have changed his actions. It might not have changed his attitudes. It might not have changed his speech towards Gentiles. And God is changing this in him, showing him these animals that were all considered unclean. And Peter thinks it's a test. He thinks it's a test, and he prides himself that he won't do it. He won't fall against traditions. Traditions are going to win out. This idea of take and eat, God calls to Peter, take and eat. Well, this idea of take and eat was a little bit more. It actually kill and eat is what we read, right? The idea of kill, that word wasn't just for sustenance, for food. It gave the picture of a sacrificial offering. So that heightens it. Not only are they not to eat unclean animals, but oh, you do not sacrifice unclean animals to God, right? This was a this was a a, a travesty. There's no way he's going to fall for this, right? He's not going to eat nor offer an unclean animal to God, and he says, "No, I, I won't do it." And God replies that He has made them clean. He says, so don't make them common or don't call them unclean is another way of putting that. Hmm. The, the point was simply this. By the death of Jesus, all, all was being reconciled. We could go, that's not just the human race, but all of creation is to be glorified and transformed in that new heaven and new earth. But inside of the human race, all were being reconciled. Jew, Gentile, slave, free, master, servant, male, female, adult, child, you name it. All were being reconciled. God was removing human distinctions that we make. In India, they have a caste system. Yeah, it's supposedly gone, but it's not. God was removing distinctions of social economic. We have that even in America, whether we want to agree to it or not. But there's certain parts of town you go, yeah, that's that park. That's that trailer park. That's that home. That's that, that you know, we have that in our societies. We even have that like, oh, that's the rich side of town. Maybe not as much in Jefferson, but no, I mean, we do. God was removing human distinctions. Can I take this another step further? I have, it was removing prejudices. We'll put it that way. All prejudices. I've known great individuals who in moments of certain situations and stress that arises and out of it arises great prejudices that come forth. Calling other people by names. Using words that are inappropriate in a non-believer's mouth, let alone in a believer's mouth, who are called to, out of the grace of God and our love for God, learn to love all people. You know, we used to sing that song, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. <laughs> but, but maybe it's, you know, that last line that Jesus loves the little children. And as we grow to adults, we're like, you know what? Yeah, no. were as bad as the Jews. Remember, they didn't want to have anything to do with the Samaritans because they were half-breeds. How many times have we heard that in our culture over the years? Racial terms about individuals who are of mixed descent. How dare we? Don't believe me that there's prejudices? Look at the church around you. 
and look at the population of your culture, there's a reason. Can I get into history for a second? Do you realize in Ashtabula County, where my church is located, 11 of our churches were parts and stops on the Underground Railroad? 11 churches. But guess what? Ashtabula County is about 96% white. That is way above the national norm. So we were a part of the Underground Railroad. We were a part of saving those who were bound in slavery, who were of different ethnicities, right? But we shipped them to other places because they weren't good enough here. Can I tell you about the forming of the American, uh, the African Methodist Episcopal Church? Yeah, these were ministers. These were ordained ministers in the Methodist church who were kneeling at an altar when they were forcibly pulled up from the altar while in prayer to the same God, right? Supposedly, they were pulled up from the altar, dragged out of the church and told they were not allowed to pray because that was the white altar. And so they formed the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Now you can say that was the past, but we do it yet today. We segregate. We allow prejudice into the church. And this is what God was speaking to Peter about in that moment. And God repeats himself three times. Why? Well, think about this. So the testimonies in Jewish culture had to be by three. You had to have three people who would come up in testimony in that culture in order for it to be considered credible. Well, God made all three of those testimonies. The gospel, the saving message of Jesus was for all. And can I tell you, all means all. Slave and free, Jew or Gentile, man or woman, white or black, you name it. The barriers of social interaction, rich and poor, were gone. The social, the barriers between races were abolished. They had to be abolished for the next step in God's plan. You see, the mission is spreading. It was spreading then and it's spreading now. And now enter these men that are standing at this gate, hollering out for Peter. They were sent by a Gentile, a Roman, a highly ranking Roman, and a God-fearing man. To, to Peter, this would have almost been like a joke. To be Roman... To be high-ranking Roman and to be a God-fearing man, it's kind of like that old joke of, you know, individuals walking in a cemetery and they see a tomb and on the tomb it says, here lies a lawyer, a politician, and an honest man. And they go, look, there's more than one person buried in this grave, <laughs> you know, because they go, that's an oxymoron. That doesn't fit. And in that day to Peter, he could have easily gone, no, that doesn't, that's not right. You can't be Roman. You can't be high-ranking Roman and you can't be a God-fearing individual all at the same time. These were the barriers that God was breaking down. How, how often do we do that? Maybe we don't go that far, but we have those inner prejudices that are stopping us. That if God were to put some face in front of us right now and say, hey, these individuals can be reached, you might go, I don't know, God. Or maybe you would say, yeah, I know that. Some missionary somewhere is going to reach them. But, but don't let them worship with me in church. They worship differently. No, they don't. You know, that is the biggest American prejudice I've ever heard, is that people worship differently. Can I tell you, I, I went to Jamaica when I was younger. And, and uh, you know, I, I kind of maybe had, maybe had that belief a little bit of my own. But, you know, you go to Jamaica and the first church that we went to, oh, my goodness, it was hopping, right? I mean, they're dancing in the aisles. Oh, we loved it as students, right? You know, it's like well, when we were Wesleyan, too. And, you know, that's kind of like a Nazarene and you weren't supposed to dance. And so we're like, we're like having fun dancing with them down the aisles when they do their offering. And they're, you know, dancing all the way up front to do the offering. And, oh, and then they did a special offering, so they do it all again, right? I mean, this was awesome. Yeah. And then guess what? We went to another church that night. I would have never thought it was the same denomination. You would have thought, you know, all the jokes about like Frozen Chosen and all, you know, I mean, they didn't lift a hand. They didn't stand to worship. And, and so here we are all fired up from that morning and all these students are standing up, they're clapping their hands and we got people staring at us like we are weird. So don't ever say, well, they worship that. No, 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 no. I, I've been in lots of white churches all white churches, right, that all worship differently. 
Don't ever allow those type of words. Those are prejudices that come out. And we as believers cannot have that. Peter recognized the call of God, and it was powerful enough in him to shatter all human distinctions, all human uh, prejudices. Notice with me that Peter was distracted in his prayer. He was distracted by hunger. I love that point because I get so upset with myself when I'm trying to pray or study God's word and I feel distracted, right? And, and, and I get so mad. I'm like, well, why can't, I, why can't I get my brain to shut down for the moment, right? Peter was distracted by his hunger. Even the apostles felt this distraction like we feel. And God, in his humor, used that hunger, that distraction to teach this is why it's so important we're going to be getting next month into this discipline of fasting. We don't understand what it is to, to want something, to have a hunger, and to be able to expect and lean on Jesus through that hunger. We don't know what that's like in our culture. And when through fasting we learn that, that even in those distractions we can lay them at the feet of Jesus. Peter responds at this blanket and he says, surely not, Lord, in some translations. Oh, remember in Matthew, Jesus spoke of his coming death and Peter looked at Jesus and he used the same words. <laughs> surely not, Lord. Remember. Another time, those counts of three that Jesus had told Peter to feed his lambs. Oh, remember Peter, though, denied three times, and then Jesus said, feed my sheep three times. And now, at this point, about clean and unclean, and everything was clean by Jesus three times. Sometimes we need the rep repetition to remember. Sometimes we need to be hit over the head multiple times to remember. Peter wakes to hear his name being asked of by these foreigners, these Romans. And he could have again said, surely not, Lord, you aren't calling me to that. No, 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 no. I, I'm meant to stay with the Jews. Surely not, Lord. But instead he responds as we should respond. And simply saying, well, where you lead, Lord, I will follow. Where you lead, I will follow. What is it that God's trying to do in your life right now that you're going, yeah, surely not, Lord. Surely that's not you speaking. And this isn't the don't call me surely conversation joke, right? No, it's, it's God is calling to us and challenging us, convicting us. And we're second guessing, going, no, that's not God. He wouldn't say that. No, God wouldn't expect that of me. And God wouldn't, no. And we, like Peter, are crying out, surely not, Lord. And Jesus is saying, come on, I need you. It's not on pastors to evangelize and save the world. It's not on staff the church the mission was given to all go and make disciples baptize teaching them all that I have commanded you go and make disciples in my name he says not in names of a Nazarene church not in your name not so people look to you for all the answers but go Oh, and that go means as you're going. We talked about it yesterday. Remember the wheel? The, the me putting your name on there and the eight people that are in your sphere of influence that God has enabled you to go to? And I challenged you at the end of yesterday to pray over those eight names and to say, God, who is it you are calling me to speak to? Good morning, Stella. Who is God calling me to? pray for who is in my sphere of influence that I just by simple things maybe even just that asking a waiter or a waitress I pray over my meal can I pray over you 
how can I pray for you who are in your sphere of influence? How are you praying that God would open your eyes to the things that you are ignoring? Because he wants to use you. He wants to use all of us. You are an integral part of his mission to seek and to save the lost. And, and can I say one more thing before we close? In Matthew, Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Jesus is sharing about the end times. And he's, you know, we, we all want to see the end time. Oh, it's coming, it's coming. But he goes, no, all those things, those are just signs of war, rumors of war. Those don't, that's not it. Those are just birth pains. It's going to happen. It's always going to happen. And then he says this. He goes, but my message will be pro proclaimed to the ends of the earth, and then the end will come. If you want to see the end, get to work. Get to work. So, Heavenly Father, we come before you and we lift you up. So, God, work in us. Reveal any prejudices. Reveal anything in our lives that we have put between us and you. God, grow us to be more and more like your son, more loving and more lovable. And we'll give you all the praise. We'll give you all the glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.